Remember, feel... these are long chapters in general. I Robin know. Hobbs it's just, long chapters. I know. We've already done like three two-part episodes, I'm pretty sure, out of yeah. 12 chapters. And I'm afraid this is going to be another one. And like, I feel really bad every time we have to do a two-part chapter. But also, because we didn't do that many in fits, but like, or in the yeah. first trilogy, but... The first trilogy also was only one character's point of view. So even when they were longer chapters, it was of one character. Yeah. So and... we didn't have to touch on everything. We could speed through some parts and yeah. we can still do that. It's just you have to talk about each point of view. So the more point of views in a chapter, the longer it's going to be anyways. Yeah. Welcome back to another episode of Is Fitz Happy. I'm Luke. And I'm Emma. And we are discussing chapter 12, part two of Mad Ship. Portrait, Portrait of, of Vivacia. <laughs> nice. Thank you. The last we left off was with Wintrow. He just came out of his father's room, telling his father to empty out the chamber pot himself. No one was going to stop him because Kyle was being insane and paranoid and blaming Wintrow for everything. Being a real brat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he exits out of Kyle Haven's room, shuts the door behind himself. His grip on the tray, the food tray, was so tight his knuckles were white. His molars hurt where his teeth were clenched together. Why, he asked aloud of no one. More quietly, he added to himself, How could that man be my father? I feel no bond to him at all. He felt a faint tremor of sympathy from the ship. I do want to say I really like that Hob has a complicated parental relationship in her series, I think. Multiple. Multiple, yeah. I mean, I none everyone of everyone <laughs> has parent issues. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> but I think especially having a character say, like, I don't have that famil a familial yeah. bond to a family member and I feel like there's something wrong with me is really real. Like, it's... It, She's real for doing that. Um, it's it's really nice to have the readers know that, like, sometimes families aren't always. I, They're not always that, loving. You yeah. Know? There's you don't not always that. Yeah. Things happen that sever. That. I don't know, that relationship. Yeah. And it's not just a given that you have that bond forever right which i think is it's not still something... a relationship you still have to work at it yeah and so i think that's really really interesting that she does that because i it goes so far against i think what pop culture is and what parental relationships are in the zeitgeist of pop culture where even if parents are awful they're still your parent or even if siblings are awful they're still your sibling and you just have to forgive and forget and you, you all love each other because you have to because you're family. And then here we have a character who really is horribly mistreated by his family member. Robin Hobb makes it easy to sympathize with Wintro in this. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I think also just allowing it to be a character who is somebody that you would expect to kind of just get over it. Yeah, true. To have the feelings of like, I don't feel like we're related. And he really I like I really don't want get along. I think that is important to have. He feels a faint tremor of sympathy from Vivacia, though. Yeah. Is that because she's just sympathizing with him in this moment? Like, yeah, Kyle sucks. Or is it because of his thought, how could that man be my father? I feel no bond to him at all. And she is very resentful of the bonds that she was forced to have. Yeah, I also had that thought. It does say a tremble of sympathy. So yeah. I'm guessing it's for Wintrow in this moment. But I think there's always going to be that undercurrent of resentment. Yeah, but I also think her resentment is more towards Kyle because... They forced that situation. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. she recognizes that she and Wintrow would have had a good bond without Kyle's interference. Like yeah. if he wouldn't have pushed as hard as he did they would be fine and so even though it is Wintrow's choices that have created the chasm between them it is overall Kyle's fault and right. so I think 
she doesn't she isn't resentful of the bond with Wintro because it's Wintro. It's because of how the bond was gone about. Yeah. So that in my mind, it's less about Wintro in that way. So I don't think she would be shady when it comes to expressing her feelings there. But it is I I do. Yeah. Like you said, I I think it is more sympathetic of. Yeah, your dad sucks. (laughs) So he's out in the hall, and all of a sudden, Sa'adar pops up in front of him. Wintro had been aware of him following him since he had left his father's room, but, and he, but he had hoped to elude him. That is a very confusing sentence, Robin Hobb. <laughs> Wintro had been aware of him following him since he left his father's room, but he had hoped to elude him. <laughs> and Wintro says that the priest had become more frightening with every passing day. So, yeah, Robin, confusing sentence, but... Sadar had been following Wintro. Wintro was hoping to just stay out of his way because he doesn't want to talk to Sadar at all. But Sadar confronts him here. He had all but disappeared for a time after Etta had marked him with her knife. Like some parasitic creature, he had burrowed deep into the holds of the ship to work his poison silently among the freed men and women. There were fewer discontents as the days passed. Kennet and his crew treated them even handedly. They were fed as well as any crew member, and the same level of effort was expected from them in caring for the ship. When they reached Divi Town, it was announced to the former slaves that any who wished to disembark might take their freedom and go. Captain Kennet wished them well, and hoped they would enjoy their new lives. Those who desired could request to stay aboard as crew, but they would have to prove themselves worthy and loyal sailors to Kennet. Wintrow had seen the wisdom in that. Kennet had effectively pulled Sa'adar's teeth. Any slave who truly desired a life of piracy and had the skill to compete could claim one. The others had their freedom. Not many had taken the road to piracy. Do you think this is another example of Kennet's luck working in his favor? Or do you think this is something that was actually really well thought out and planned and like they really took into consideration what saw adar was doing on deck i don't think it's about saw adar necessarily i think it was the plan all along and it worked out well that it fit into this as well Hmm. i I don't think he was ever going to do anything besides set the slaves free right Right. he wants to dump the cargo i'm (laughs) sure it was kenneth's thought and it just so happens that Sa'adar's whole backing was from the former former slaves. So when he sets them free, yeah, the slaves are going to go, and then there goes all the backing for Sa'adar. True, yeah. So it just kind of two birds, one stone worked out perfectly. Yeah. With the way he was going to do it anyways. My other question is, why does Sa'adar want a live ship so bad? It's not the live ship. It's... We talked about this a little bit, and we'll get into it a little bit more, I think. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll bring it up okay, again Okay, we can wait then. Yeah. So, the taller, older man stepped abruptly around Wintrow. Sadar stood before him, blocking his passage. Wintrow gla- glanced past him. He was alone, so there's no map faces here. Wintrow had to turn his eyes up to look to Sadar. The man's face was graven with discontent and fanaticism. His unkempt hair spilled onto his forehead. His clothes had not been washed in days. His eyes burned as he accused, I saw you leave your father's room. Wintrow spoke civilly and ignored the question. I'm surprised you are still aboard. I am sure there is much work for a priest of Saw in a place like Divitown. The freed slaves would surely appreciate your assistance in building new lives here. Saadar narrowed his eyes at Wintrow. You mock me. You mock my priesthood, and in doing so, you mock yourself and Sa. He snakes out his arm and catches hold of Wintrow's shoulder. You forsake your priesthood and Sa in what you do here. This is a ship built of death, speaking with death's tongue. A follower of the life god should not be servant to it. It is not too late for you, lad. Recall who you were. Align yourself once more with life and right. You know this ship belongs by right to those who seized it for themselves. This vessel of cruelty and bondage could become a ship of freedom and righteousness. Let me go, Wintrow said quietly. This is my last warning to you. Sa'adar came very close to him. 
his breath hot and rancid in Wintrow's face. It is your last chance to redeem yourself from your past errors and put your feet on the true path to glory. Your father must be delivered to judgment. If you are the instrument of that, your own part in the transgressions can be forgiven. I myself will judge it so. Then this ship must be surrendered to those who rightfully claim her. Make Kenneth see that. He is a sick man. He cannot withstand us. We rose and unseated one despot. Does he believe we cannot do it again? All right, so now we get his context. We know from Wintrow's point of view that his eyes are burning with fanaticism. He hasn't washed in days. He's kind of went underground for a long time <laughs> after he got yeah. struck down by Edda. We talked before about how Sa'adar's slavery seemed to change him or probably changed him. We don't mm -hmm. know him from before it. And I really think it is showing here how unhinged he is getting. We also talked a little bit before about slaves not wanting to give up anything that they took from the dead crew of Vivacia because yeah. it was then theirs. It was their ownership. They were free people and they had possessions again, right? Mm -hmm. I think that Sa'adar sees the live ship as his right, his thing. It doesn't want to give it up because he's a free man and he earned it because that's what kind of does, right? He gives up the ship to the freed slaves. Right. So in his mind, in his slowly unhinged and slightly insane mind, he's thinking, can it stole from slaves? And this is mine by right. He is sick. He's ruling as a tyrant. He should give us what is ours. So you either make him see that or we can overthrow him again. And then the second part of his thing is all about Kyle, who ran the slave ship, right? He wants to take Vivacia back. And maybe in his mind, he's like, this is a righteous thing because this ship could be much more than just a slave ship. We could free other slavers. Yeah, so I think what really strikes me with Sa'adar is the difference between himself and Kennet, weirdly. Kennet also believes that he is chosen by some divine providence to lead and to take over. And he has been given this luck that allows him to have power, which is similar to what Saw Dar believes that like Saw has chosen him and it is using him as a tool. Like I think right. they're very similar beliefs, but the way Kennet believes in this doesn't feel as crazy, I guess. Like, <laughs> Kennet is able to be a rational human being still, and he's not he's not like, I'm special. I, I guess he is going around saying, I'm, so, I'm going to be yeah. the king someday. But it's he... Like, I will forgive your own transgressions in this matter in the slave ship. I will judge it so. Yeah. And Wintrow's whole point is that no one can judge but Saw, so he always was kind of wary of traveling judge priests. Right. But Saadar was one, so he's taken upon himself to judge he's jury the executioner. Judge. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's very odd. I think also I find it interesting that Saadar number one places any blame on Wintro for what happened, but number two is trying to act as though Wintro has no claim to the ship. Because without Wintro, they would not have been free. So as much as Wintro wants to deny his role in this... He was a slave too. He was a slave <laughs> too and is the reason everyone is free. So really, the ship then belongs to Wintro by this logic. Wintro is the catalyst to making the people free. And I think the fact that Saw Adar is trying to get rid of Wintro on the spot is... Well, he's also trying to manipulate him, like, right? He's he's trying to guilt him into saying you've strayed from Saw's path. And as like a full priest to a trainee, mm -hmm. he's really trying to lean into that guilty conscience of I will absolve you of all your crimes. But of course, he's also a little fevered and insane. So yeah, <laughs> doesn't I don't come know. off in a benediction way. <laughs> right. But it just 
I don't know. I, I just have a weird feeling about the whole idea that Wintrow is to blame in any way and that saw and their almighty wisdom would blame Wintrow. <laughs> I don't know. I, it's just something that really stuck out to me when reading this. And I think that's probably a lot of why Wintrow can see through Saw Adar because he is a really devout follower of Saw. And I, I think saying that the ship is made of death and cannot possibly be something that is approved by the God of Light is something that Wintrow has been trying to puzzle through. However, if it is this ship of death that the God of Light hates, why are you then trying to take over as a priest of Saw? Right. It just, it's all contradictory, which I guess is Saw's nature, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know. Just thoughts I had. So then with this whole discussion of Wintro, you could be, your sins could be forgiven by me. Just go tell Kenneth that we'll take over if he doesn't give us what he wants or what we want. And Wintro kind of has to be the voice of reason again, right after this dealing with his father. I think this is also a nice juxtaposition of another kind of crazy person blaming Wintro and trying to control Wintro's actions and trying to control Kenneth through Wintro. And he, tries to reason with Sawdaw first by saying, if I were to go repeat what you just said to Kennet, you would be dead and I would be dead. Everybody would be dead because that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard <laughs> to talk to, to say to a pirate captain, captain sick or not. <laughs> yeah. And then he says, be content with what he has given you, a new chance at life. Seize it and go on. Wintro tried to writhe away, but the man only tightened his grip. Now get your hands off me and let go, Wintro felt his self-control slipping. Suddenly, vividly, he was recalling this man in the hold of the Vivacia. Freed of his chains, his first act had been to take Gantry's life. Gantry had been a good man in his way, a better man than Saadar had ever shown himself to Wintro. I warn you, the erstwhile prince, priest of Sa began, but Wintrow's pent grief and banked anger suddenly overwhelmed him. He shoved the wooden tray hard into the man's gut. Taken by surprise, Saadar staggered back, gasping for air. A part of Wintrow knew it was enough. He could have walked away. He was shocked when he dropped the tray to drive two more blows into the man's chest. In detachment, he saw his right and then his left fist connect. There were body punches, connecting with satisfyingly solid sounds. Even so, Wintrow was amazed to see the taller man give ground, stumbling back against the wall and sliding partially down it. It shocked him to discover his own physical strength. Worse, it felt good to knock the man down. He gritted his teeth, resisting the impulse to kick him. Leave me alone, he warned Sadar in a low growl. Don't talk to me again or I'll kill you. The shaken man coughed as he clambered up the wall. Puffing, he pointed a finger at Wintrow. See what you've become. It's the voice of this unnatural ship using you as a mouthpiece. Break free, boy, before you are damned forever. Wintrow turned on his heel and strode away. He left the tray and crockery where it had fallen. It was the first time in his life he had fled from the truth. Mm. <laughs> so now we talk about Vivacia a bit. And her influence in this scene, potentially. Do you think some of that anger from Vivacia was in Wintro and made him react this way? Mm, I anger. think it's not impossible that her anger was compounded with his, but I do not think his actions were influenced by Vivacia. I think Wintro's actions in this moment are his own, and I think it's from being driven from a place of dealing just dealing with his father and the awfulness that he had to deal with in that and then basically dealing with the exact same thing with Saadar right after but having that pent up PTSD of Saadar murdering somebody that Wintro cared about in front of him so i think that that especially that memory 
could have been sparked from vivacia or even heightened because of vivacia that anger from that memory but i think his actions are his own and it's just a moment where his anger overtook him because we know that it runs in, first of all the anger issues run in the family but number two wintro has been trained to keep himself calm and has been showing up into this point signs of having anger issues that he is keeping control of, but only just barely. Yes. However, as a counterpoint, he's also very aware of Vivacia's influence over his moods, and mm-hmm. he says he's running from the truth when Saadar says this. That's why I give it a little bit more credence that Vivacia's anger at Kyle, first of all, she hates Kyle. Right. And to Sa'adar, they, they both think he's not very good of a person, and they both liked Gantry. Yeah. And it says that unbidden, he all of a sudden he sees Sa'adar and remembers him killing Gantry in the hold. Is that vivacious memory? Like, is that her pushing those feelings? I don't think that memory was from vivacia i think that was because he was getting cornered and saw adar was becoming more wild and a little bit more vicious and i think that really just recalled to his mind who saw adar really is like yeah possibly i i don't think that part has anything to do i think vivacia definitely also felt that memory and compounded to the angry reaction that happens after that memory but i don't think it's her that brought the memory to the surface see the the reason i say that is because of the uh the adverbs here suddenly vividly Mm. he recalls this and we know that her memories are very very vivid and very real life because she literally remembers (laughs) everything so i don't know Maybe, maybe it's, she does have... I'm just saying it's a possibility. I don't know if I believe one way or the other in okay. this. I think it definitely is a possibility. I don't think there's a, a 0% chance that she has something to do with this or... I don't know, but I, I think... I think this was his anger getting the better of him either way. I, so, I don't do you think... think he's trying to blame Vivacia then, saying that he's running from the truth? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. I also think it's weird that he's like, it's the first time I've ran from the truth. Like, the boy does nothing but run from the truth, first of all. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> but second of all, the I don't know, it just is so dramatic. It, it feels it's a lot so like... It's so true that you can hear Wintrow's pitter-pattering as he's running away from you right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think, like you said last episode... Kyle kind of hit the nail on the head when he said that Wintro refuses to take responsibility for any of his actions. And I think this is just that. Okay. And I did argue with you at that point, but I will say in this moment, I think this, this is that the refusal to admit. Well, let us know what you guys think. Email us at isfitshappy.com or at gmail.com, excuse me, or comment on any of our posts. We want to, we want to know. I don't know if this is a vivacious influence or not. And do you think she's going that dark? Because I think she has the propensity to. And we know that she does. She's now connected to Kenneth. And in this next section, we do learn that she is taking his anger from him. Yeah. So. Putting it out of his reach. So it's not necessarily directing it somewhere, but it could be. Could be. Anyways, we, as Emma mentioned, get to Kenneth's point of view here. Captain Kennet is in his bedding. He is laying down and he's saying, well, Etta and Wintro are confining me to bed for a little bit longer. They say I need to rest, so I have. He is trimming himself. He says, it feels better to have a freshly trimmed mustache. And it improves his appearance, but overall he's lost a ton of flesh, lost a ton of weight. And he's very gaunt and pale. Yeah, he is very sickly looking, I would say. He just spent, I don't know, a month, maybe three, (laughs) trying to fight for his life over an infection in his leg that he is just now recovering from. So obviously he isn't looking like the strapping outdoorsman 
<laughs> that he used to be, but he also is coming off of an illness. So it makes sense, but he is not taking it well because his image is everything to him. I think a really big part of his armor is how he appears to others. And right. so seeing that he isn't well and that he's visibly weak is really hurting him right now and really mm -hmm. making him feel vulnerable. He does take pleasure in seeing that the charm is not responding to him and is also kind of pale in color. Yeah. <laughs> he says, good. It should have brought him luck and said it had served him this. Let the charm share his fate. He tapped it at it with his fingernail. Nothing to say. He jeered at it. It was impassive. I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah. So Kenneth snatched up the mirror again and peered into it. His leg was healing. They all told him he would live. What was the good of that if he could no longer command respect from his crew? He had become a withered scarecrow of a man. His haggard reflection reminded himself of a street beggar in Divi Town. Slams the mirror down, leans back, uncovers his leg a bit, his stump, and pokes at it savagely with a finger. He says the pain has gone down into like a weird sting and numbness ish it's almost an itch but not quite yeah he lifted it from the bed it looked ridiculous a seal's flipper not a man's leg total despair washed over him he imagined drawing cold salt water into his mouth and nose pulling icy death into him refusing to choke or splutter it would be quick the passion of his despair retreated abruptly stranding him in helplessness he did not even have the wherewithal to take his own life. Long before he managed to drag himself to the ship's railing, Etta would clutch at him, whining and imploring and bearing him back to his bed. Perhaps that had always been her aim in maiming him. Yes, she had chopped off his leg and fed it to the sea serpent so that she could finally master him. He goes through this whole plan that she had. And he tries to feed this, imagining in detail how she had probably planned it for months. Her eventual goal was to keep the live ship for herself, of course. Sorkor was probably involved in it as well. He would have to be very careful to conceal from them that he suspected. If they knew, they'd... Ridiculous. It was ridiculous and silly, the product of his long convalescence. Such thoughts were unworthy of him. Before I move on, I just want to quick note that that paranoia that planning that seeing all of the conspiracies in all this crew is normal that's kind yeah, of that's who he's he trying is. to feed that and keep that and then all of a sudden oh no it's ridiculous if he puts such intensity of feeling into something then let him put it into regaining his health Etta might be lacking in many things including breeding and courtesy but she was certainly not plotting against him if he was tired of his bed he should tell them so it was a fine spring day. He could be assisted to the foredeck. She would love to see his face again. It had been so long since they had talked. Kenneth had dim, resentful memories of his mother's gentle hands carefully unfolding his chubby fingers from some forbidden object he had managed to possess. So had she spoken to him then, softly and reasonably, as she took the gleaming wood and shining metal of the knife away. He recalled he had not succumbed to her gentleness, but had screamed his displeasure. He felt the same defiance now. He did not want to be reasonable. He did not want to be consoled with something else. He wanted his fury to be justified and proven. But Vivatia was inside him, weaving herself through his being. He was too weakened to resist her as she took his angry suspicions and set them out of his reach. He was left with a sourceless dissatisfaction that made his head ache. He blinked the sting of tears from his eyes. Weepy like a woman, he jeered at himself. So you go through that. There's that abrupt shift of like, no, this is ridiculous. My paranoia is ridiculous. And then at the end of that paragraph, it's it, it was a fine spring day. He could be assisted to the foredeck. Mm -hmm. She would love to talk to love to see his face again. It had been so long since they had talked. And I think the first time reading this book ever i'm like oh there's still he's still talking about edda in this yeah but no it shifts to vivacia in there because vivacia is the one telling him these things and making him think these things yeah which is kind of even scarier yes he knows though so it's not fully insidious it's just awful to feel completely not in your own he body. can't even get privacy in his own mind yeah vivacia's there he can't there. be angry yeah <laughs> 
it's it's a really weird phenomenon to be that vivacia is so invasive in this i mean it's not that weird because we know how this is kind of how she wanted to bond with wintro right she wanted to be part of him all of the time and to be with him entwined have that identity with wintro and she's now trying to do that with kennett but kind of in a different way it's I don't know. It's just such a weird thing to me, especially because the whole like these thoughts aren't worthy of you. You're so amazing because (laughs) supposedly she's been in his mind for a while now. Right. So why wouldn't she just see that that's who he is? That that's Kenneth. Kenneth just is like that. Yeah. But we know that there's things that you can hide from each other and like depths that you can't get to without, I don't know, like mutual. (laughs) Yeah. I, I guess I just my point is that Kennet isn't as amazing as he seems to be. If somebody could even just surface level read his mind, he is way less amazing than he sets out to be. So That's I, true. So I don't understand where this fascination on Vivacious come end comes from when he is clearly not the person he's pretending to be to her. You know what I mean? She could also just be dismissing it as this is him healing and in pain and he just needs to get over this and then when he's better he'll be fine again Mm. she didn't know him before i guess i don't know she's romanticizing it just but it also feels so weirdly controlling from vivacia oh it is it is she's making him into the version that she wants him to be without his consideration at all which feels so opposite to what she has been learning like she doesn't want people she doesn't want wintro to dictate who she becomes and she has really been trying to work to find herself and in that has decided that means that she can control others it just something about that is so wrong to me literally changes his emotions and then leaves him weepy (laughs) yeah and then leaves like why (laughs) i don't know it's just weird well then someone taps at the door and he composes himself throws a blanket over his leg and says enter he had expected etta instead it was the boy His face was unflawed and open. His tattoo was hidden in shadow. Captain Kennett, he queried in a low voice, did I wake you? Not at all. Come in. He could not say why the sight of Wintra was like balm to his spirit. Perhaps it had to do with the ship's feelings. The boy's appearance had improved since he had been in Kennett's care. He smiled at the youth as he approached the bed and had the pleasure of seeing the boy shyly return it. His coarse black hair was sleeked back from his face and bound into the traditional seaman's queue. The clothing Etta had sewn him sewn suited him well. The loose white shirt, a bit large for him, was tucked into his dark blue trousers. He was small for his age, a lean and supple youth. Wind and sun had weathered the boy's face. The warm color of his skin, his white teeth and dark eyes, the dark trousers merging into the darkness of the corridor behind him, It was all a chance composition of perfect light and shadow. Even the hesitant, questioning look on his face was perfect as he emerged from dimness into the muted light of the chamber. I have a little bit of a tinfoil hat theory that I've just come up with in this reading after we're talking so much about Vivacious influence. Nice. So what if Kenneth's... I guess attraction to Wintro outside of Vivacia's influence would have only been the fact that aesthetically he looks nice and clearly knows looks like he's well bred. You know what I mean? Like Kenneth has this like right. image thing and he looks like he would be a noble and that's what Kenneth likes about people. I think what if outside of Vivacia's presence, that's all it is. And then with Vivacia messing with his mind and feeding into his emotions and doing weird he sees stuff more of a bond with them because they're both connected to vivacia yes but also it becomes this weird blurred line of almost romance of more than just the feeling because we know later can it takes advantage of althea to get rid of the feelings he's having with of wintrow and to 
release those feelings and take control mm-hmm. of them and to not become what Igret was. Right. And so I wonder if part of those feelings and part of the reason he's so conflicted is because he isn't attracted to men. He is just conflating emotions with what Vivacia has like interesting colored his lens of Wintro. Interesting I, theory that you just came up with. Yes. I feel like Kenneth felt a connection before Vivacia was in his head before he was introduced. Yes, he was on deck, but that's before he was even introduced to Vivacia. So, like, when Wintro, like, threatened him to kick his leg, basically. Yeah, but that connection was specifically on their similarities and what he saw of himself mm-hmm. in Wintro. Yeah. That wasn't necessarily aesthetics or, like, oh, mm. this is kind of hot. So I mean, you, it could be read that way. So do you think Vivacia thinks that Wintro is an attractive person and that's why? Or do you think th- just their intimacy of the bond kind of leaks through and there's I, a closeness that can it feels with him i think the love that leaks through from the bond between vivacia and wintro is such an odd feeling that because can it can't feel yes, that can <laughs> it doesn't really feel love towards people and he doesn't interesting have admiration in any way so those feelings could easily be confused for attraction especially when he sees potential in wintro and wants wintro to become just like him like i really believe that there is a connection without vivacia but i'm wondering if with vivacia there it's confused it's blurring the lines he doesn't understand the feeling that he's feeling he's wondering if this makes him like igret which freaks him out and he doesn't want to be that way that's the opposite of what he mm-hmm. wants and i'm not saying that like he's it's, not even he's not even freaking out about this connection though right yet. now i know not yeah. yet but as he's feeling these feelings he's like oh no this is perfect he's just a such a balm to my spirit so yeah but i also wonder if that's because again it's vivacia in there and Mm. it's it's really hard to differentiate he's weak right now to her weaving stuff in her in his mind so it again it's just a theory that i just came up with i think it doesn't excuse either way the stuff that happens later i don't think it's okay i'm not i don't know i don't want to excuse the wrongness of it i just what if that's part of it so what you which do you think is the real thing or what are you sticking with in your head or are you going to argue both of them? Cause we've had this discussion before and we've talked about how Kenneth is a closeted gay man to himself as well. So now we have two different sides of the same coin. Yeah. Which one do you ascribe to or just going to kind of feed into both? I don't know. I feel like I've just never considered the possibility of him not being a closeted gay man, yeah. if that makes sense. I mean, especially because we know that Etta isn't like a the curvy woman you would expect. She a is not pretty man. by anyone else's standards except for Kenneth. Yes. And Quintro. And, <laughs> and it is described that she has a boyish figure. Like it's yes. not that's just how she's described. And so it kind of really fits into that. And that kind of thought that maybe he's trying to, but maybe that's just his type. Yeah. Maybe truly, or maybe he likes both. Maybe he likes men and women. I don't know. I, I think that there is maybe a way to think about this as him just being somebody who, because of the trauma of his childhood cares about cleanliness and his image. And in a way that is stemming more from trauma than from, the fact that he interesting is a closeted gay man or whatever yeah. i mean not that being gay means that you dress well but right <laughs> not trying to say that so to answer your question i think i will be allowing both to maybe be true in my mind i think there are arguments for both so i'll just keep looking yeah <laughs> yeah another step carried wintro further into the room the tattoo on his face was suddenly not only visible it was an indelible flaw a stain on the boy's innocence. The pirate could see the torment in the boy's eyes and sensed a misery in him. Kenneth knew a moment of rage. Why, he demanded suddenly, why were you marked like that? What possible excuse did he have? The boy's hand flew to his cheek. A flickering show of emotions rushed across his face, shame, anger, confusion, and then impassivity. His voice was even and low. I suppose he thought it would teach me something. 
Perhaps it was his revenge because I had not been the son he wished me to be. Perhaps it was his way of repairing that. He made me a slave instead of his son, or it could have been something else. He was, I think, jealous of my bond with the ship. When he marked my face with hers, it was his way of saying we were welcome to one another because we had rejected him. Maybe. It was an enlightening to watch Winter's face as he spoke. The careful words could not completely disguise the pain. The boy's floundering attempts at an explanation revealed that it was a question he had agonized over often. Kenneth suspected that none of the possible answers satisfied him. It was obvious his father had never bothered to explain it. Wintrow advances and says, I need to look at your stump now. And Kenneth appreciates his bluntness. It's not a leg, it's just a stump. And he appreciates that honesty. That integrity was oddly comforting. The boy would not lie to him. Yeah, so we definitely have this budding relationship between Kenneth and Wintrow. And I think relationship in the term of uh, platonic at this yeah. point. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's definitely starting to grow. I think there is appreciation on Kenneth's side. We see that with how Wintrow is kind of the only one in Kenneth's corner to just be straight up with him. I think everybody else is so so used to trying to flatter him and just they couch their words with so much you know overture or yeah and obviously yeah. wintro isn't just saying whatever he wants but wintro also isn't afraid to contradict kennet right if he feels that it needs to be done and i think that's something that kennet really appreciates and enjoys like finally somebody who gets it you know sort of feeling I want to talk briefly about Kenneth's aversion to Wintrow's tattoo. And like we mentioned before, Kenneth does feel that connection to Wintrow and the similarities when they were boys. Mm -hmm. And I want to bring attention to his first tattoo was the seven pointed star of Igret mm -hmm. that he burned off. And now he sees a tattoo from his own father, from Wintrow's father on Wintrow's face of another ship. And he's like, why would they do that? Cause like Kenneth sees tattoos as mistakes. Yeah. He gets them tattooed and then burned off and it's behind him. So I, I think there's a, a connection there besides just, Oh, his innocence is flawed or whatever. You know, it's, it's that connection to tattoos that Kenneth has as well. Yeah. Interesting thought. Anyways, Wintro needs to look at the stump <laughs> and Kenneth is like, well, great. He doesn't lie to me. That's awesome. So you say you had rejected your father. Is that how you still feel about him? Kenneth could not say why the boy's answer would be so important to him. A shadow crossed the boy's face. For a moment, Kenneth thought Wintro would lie to him, but the hopelessness of truth was in his voice when he spoke. He is my father. I owe him the duty of a son. Sa commands us to respect our parents and exalt over any goodness we find in them. But in truth, I wish... I wish he were out of my life. Not dead, no, I don't wish that, he added hastily as he met Kenneth's intent stare. I just wish he were somewhere else, somewhere safe, but... Where I just didn't have to deal with him anymore, he finished in a near whisper. Where I didn't have to feel diminished each time he looked at me. I can arrange that, Kenneth answered him easily. The stricken look on the boy's face plainly wondered what wish he had just been granted. He started to speak, then apparently decided that keeping silent was safer. Does the tattoo bother you? He heard himself ask as Wintrow turned the blankets back. Wintrow bends over and says, just a moment, wait a moment, I'm trying to do something. And he becomes absolutely still and raises his hand above Kenneth's stump and focuses and tries to do something that he probably saw some priest, that healer, Sa Parte, mm -hmm. do to some, someone else. And nothing seems to happen. Yeah, I think we do get the only description from a second person's point of view of what it looks like when somebody is using the skill in depth. Because whenever Fitz talks about people using the skill, he isn't like looking at their face facial expressions and talking about it but in this moment we have Kenneth talking about how with Wintro concentrating his pupils fully dilate 
And I thought that was a really interesting detail because we know that Robin Hobb has written the skill as like, what if magic was drugs? Yeah. And I think, yeah. And I think one of the, like, I don't know, I guess I'm not well versed in drug use, but isn't a thing about drugs that they make your pupils dilate, which is something I thought about. I don't know if that was intentional, but I was just like, Hey, it's the drug thing. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Um, But I did think that was a cool detail that like, we don't get otherwise and Fitz would never notice or never deign to tell us. <laughs> right. Kind of also notes that Wintrow's hands trembled slightly as in vast effort. But after a few moments, Wintrow opens his eyes. He's like, well, you're supposed to feel something, so I must have done it wrong. And then f- remembers Kenneth's question and says, when I think of it, meaning the tattoo, I wish it were not there. However, it is there and will be there for the rest of my life. The sooner I accept it as part of my face, the wiser I will be. Wiser how? Kenneth pressed him. Wintrow smiled, thinly at first, but as he spoke it grew more genuine. It was said often at my monastery, the wise man takes the shortest path to peace with himself. Acceptance of what is, that is the shortest path. As he spoke the final words, his hands came to rest on Kenneth's stump in a light but firm grip. Does this hurt? Warmth started at the boy's hands and shot out from them. A jolt of heat went up Kenneth's spine. The pirate was struck dumb. Wintrow's words seemed to echo through his bones. Acceptance of what is. That is the shortest path to peace with yourself. This is wisdom. Does it hurt? Does wisdom hurt? Does peace hurt? Does acceptance hurt? His skin tightened and tingled all over his body. Kenneth gasped for breath. He could not answer. He was suffused with the boy's simple faith. It rushed through him, warm and reassuring. Of course he was right. Acceptance. He could not doubt or deny it. What had he been thinking? Whence the weakness that had made him falter? His earlier thoughts of drowning himself were suddenly abhorrent the self-pitying whining of a weakling. He was meant to go on. He was destined to go on. His luck had not failed him when the serpent took his leg. His luck had sustained him. His leg was all it had taken. Are you all right? Wintrow asked. The words seem unnaturally loud to Kenneth's renewed senses. You've healed me, he said in a hoarse whisper. I'm healed. Um, interesting things happening. Yeah. So I know last episode we joked about Wintrow thinking that Kenneth is basically Jesus. Yes. Um, was this Saw talking to Kenneth? <laughs> no, I, I think this is Wintrow thinking he did not complete whatever skill thing he was doing and mm-hmm. then touch made it activate. Mm. He had just gotten done intensely doing something with his hands and then as soon as Robin Hobb mentions he puts the hand on Kenneth's leg, that's where warmth starts shooting out of. Yeah, no, no, no. Not that part. I mean, the thought process that follows. Oh, no, I don't think so. The, like, I was meant to go on. No, I think that's just Kenneth's <laughs> delusions of, of grandeur <laughs> and, yes, <laughs> his incredible self-worth. <laughs> Some of his incredible thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> he has an incredible mind. He's going to destroy Big Brother for sure. <laughs> Meaning Satrap Cosgo and <laughs> Chelsea Pirates. <laughs> yeah, so uh, something happens to him here. I was also wondering if maybe the idea of acceptance of what you are going through had to be talked about or even just thought about in Wintro's mind to make this work. So maybe not even the touch, but the, the act of yeah, the, the thinking, yeah, the healing thoughts, not just because Wintro doesn't know what he's doing. Right. So right. I do wonder if that he inadvertently stumbled on the, what key. actually needed to happen. Yeah, that, that could be true. And it's something that Wintro learned himself, right? He had to be, he had to learn that with a talk from Vivesha, I believe as well, that if he lost his finger, this was when it was still damaged and deep down he knew it had to be amputated. Mm-hmm. He wouldn't be different. He'd yeah. just have nine fingers. Yeah. He'd still be him. 
And I think that's what Kenneth has to learn here as well, right? Acceptance of what is, acceptance of himself. Definitely. Yeah, this moment also, clearly it's Kenneth interacting with the skill in some way. Yeah. Um, because... We're getting affected by it. Yeah. I don't know. I think because of the rush of joy, but also the... Rush of joy, the... The senses, whenever he is drawn out of that being... Unnaturally loud, yeah. Yeah. So, like, clearly it's something to do with the skill in this way, but... It also reminds me of how Wintro sometimes gets stuck on words or phrases and is like, oh my gosh, there's so much meaning in this. And he's like kind right. of in that skill loop of like, I am one with the world. Oh my gosh, I'm so connected. And that feels like this too. And I think it's a really interesting thing to do because it does kind of mirror Wintro. And it mm -hmm. again points to how similar they are yeah, this whole definitely. they just both need to hear that one phrase and all of a sudden they're like, my mind has been unlocked. <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of goes crazy here, but in a good way. <laughs> yeah, for once. <laughs> he, he looks down at his leg and he's like, no, no, it's not a leg. It's a stump. And there was still a pang of loss at beholding it. But that was all. The shape of his body had changed. Once he had been young and beardless, and now he was not. Once he had walked upon two legs, now he would learn to get about on one. That was all. A change. To be accepted. Quick as a cat's pounce, he seized the boy by his shoulders and jerked him near. Wintrow cried out and braced his hands on the bunk to keep from falling. Kenneth captured the boy's head between his hands. For an instant, Wintrow struggled. Then his eyes locked with Kenneth's. He stared, his gaze going wider and wider. Kenneth smiled at him. He smoothed one long thumb across the boy's tattoo. Wipe it away, he commanded him. On your face... It goes no deeper than your skin. You do not need to bear it on your soul. For five breaths more, Kenneth held him, until he saw a sort of wonder cross Wintrow's features. Kenneth placed a kiss on his brow, then released him. As Wintrow drew back, Kenneth sat up all the way. He swung his leg off the bed. And he says, I'm tired of lying about. Go get some stuff done. Set up, change of clothes for me. Send Etta in. I'm going to go on deck. Yeah, so Wintro is the closest thing to a therapist this world has. <laughs> yeah, true, true. And, and doesn't take any of his lessons for himself. No. <laughs> and he, what Kenneth drove into him right at the end there was, yeah, accept yourself. Yeah. It doesn't affect who you are. The tattoo is just there. Take that into your soul. <laughs> yeah, because clearly it's bothering him. And I don't know, I just... I'm happy that Kenneth gets a moment of peace and uh, like this change in spirit of right. He like found his will to live again. He's still an awful person, but I think in this moment it's, it's really easy to forget that and to be like, Oh, finally he's not being a whiny baby about losing his leg, which like also I would be the whiniest of babies <laughs> if I had to lose my leg. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I it's deserved. I get it. But I think Ha having been in his head for the last multiple chapters of him just i'm tired of life i want to die this is awful and then finally getting him to accept his situation and move forward is such a breath of fresh air right so he commands wintro about and it brought him great satisfaction to see wintro hasten to obey his commands the boy knew how to take an order now that was a useful thing in a pretty lad and no mistake he did not know his way about Kenneth's possessions, Etta was better at matching up his clothes, but what Wintrose had set out was serviceable enough. There would be plenty of time to educate his eye for dress. And then Kenneth turns, him, turns to himself to educate himself on how to dress himself. <laughs> yes. Also, he does call, call Wintrow a pretty boy. Yes. I don't know, maybe he does have, maybe there are feelings there that would have been anyway. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Vivacious is still with him though too so True. literally i think it's something that you could argue either side True. any evidence we get so just interesting so kenneth is trying to struggle into his clothes with his one leg the fabric hung up on his stump and rubbed against his new skin unpleasantly he told himself he would soon build a callus the empty plant leg flapped in a ghastly way Etta would have to pin that for him, or better yet, sew it. The leg was gone. There was little sense in pretending otherwise. 
He grinned wryly as he struggled with a single stocking and a boot. Why should half as much work take twice as long? His body kept overbalancing and teetering on the edge of the bed. He was just finishing when Etta entered the room. Her gaze turned reproachful. I would have helped you with all that. I didn't need help, he retorted. Save with this pant leg, he should have sewn them up for me. I intend to be out of bed today. Do you know where my crutch is? She says I think you're rushing yourself. You know, you should you know, lay back in bed. You'll probably feel you probably feel better now, but you just got rid of the fever. I mean, come on. Yeah, you your place is about. Yeah. yeah, your place is going to bed. Like it's fine. How dare she? Had she completely forgotten who he was and what she was? My bed is my place. His hand shot out to trap her wrist. Before she could react, he jerked her close to him, his other hand seizing her jaw. He turned her face to meet her his eyes. Don't ever tell me what I am healthy enough to do, he reminded her severely. The closeness of her, her quick breath against his face and her wide eyes suddenly stirred him. She took in a quick, fearful breath and triumph coursed through him. This was right. Before he could take command on his deck again, he'd have to take command in his own chamber. This woman would must not be allowed to think she was in charge. She gasped as he pulled her against him. My bed is where you belong, wench, he told her in a voice suddenly gone husky. If you say so, she murmured submissively. Her eyes were black and huge. This is like the closest a Kenneth and Etta scene gets to being somewhat romantic. And it would be better if it was from Etta's point of view, because then we wouldn't have to hear the awfulness behind Kenneth's thoughts. Yeah, but that's like all of them, right? It's always yeah. some sort of driving force behind Kenneth. It's just like... This feels gross, but as like, oh, this is like playful. You're flirting with me. Yeah, it's very enemies to lovers vibes, but like from Kenneth's point of view. (laughs) Yeah, but but from an actual enemy point of view. (laughs) I don't know. I don't love it. (laughs) But that's true. It is close ish. Yeah, it's to the least bad he has been in his interactions with bringing Etta to bed. Before we move on to Brashen's point of view for one last time, I do want to bring it all the way back, since we got Etta in this part, Mm -hmm. to what Vivacia is saying to Kenneth when she's taking away his anger. Yeah. (laughs) Let me me scroll back here a little bit. Oops. Scroll because you use the Kindle instead of a physical book Uh, like me? Excuse me, me, it's a nook. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Big difference. (laughs) (laughs) So Vivacia in his head says, Etta might be lacking in many things, including breeding and courtesy, but she was certainly not plotting against him. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to point that out as we got Etta at the end, that Vivacia and her still do not get along very yeah, well. <laughs> Vivacia still doesn't like Etta, but I think she still, she does respect Etta for being able to take care of Kenneth. Yes, yes. So she understands it's it at a, least. It's the same thing with Etta and Sorcor a bit. We yeah. didn't really talk about it that much, but that's their bond is Kenneth and mm-hmm. the rivalry is Kenneth, right? They're, everyone yeah. is vying for his attention. Everyone but Wintro. Why don't we just ask him to ransom us? <laughs> yeah. Has he sent the note yet? <laughs> so we get back to Brashen and they are pulling into Divi Town Harbor. They have made it. And Brashen is so close to Wintro in this section. Yeah. Oh, man. Brashen looked at the sprawling settlement with amazement. When he had been here last, years ago, there had been a few huts, a wharf, and some shacks that passed for taverns. Now, candlelight shone through dozens of windows, and the brackish anchorage boasted a small forest of masts. Even the smells of squalor that hung in the air had become thicker. If all the scattered pirate settlements he had seen were gathered into one place, they would equal or possibly exceed the population of Bingtown. They were growing, too. If they were mustered under one leader, they would be a force to be reckoned with. Brashen wondered if that was the potential this Kennet would-be king of the pirates also saw. If he gained such power, what would he do with it? Captain Finney had seemed to think him mostly a braggart. Brashen fervently hoped it was so. I think this is really interesting and also makes me wonder what the size of Bingtown is. I don't know if I've talked about this before, but my image of Bingtown is of kind of a small settlement, which I know is not right. I know it's way more populated than 
I think of it as in my mind's eye. Yeah. Because we only really get to see the like two roads that Althea and her family go down. So that's really why I. Uh, there's three. The docks. <laughs> If you can consider that a road. The, the docks go into the one, one of the two roads they go down, is my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's the road to their house, the Rain Wild Road. There's the dock road. And then they have to go to the old traders concourse. We should, I should like draw a picture and post on our social media what my my brain <laughs> thinks of as you the map should. of Bingtown. That'd you be, should. That'd be great. <laughs> because it's very small. <laughs> but anyway, it reminds me that there are probably a lot more people in Bingtown than we have previously thought about definitely it's a a large city yeah and so when brashen says that there's probably enough to rival the population i'm like oh wow so there's like a lot a lot because a lot of settlements yeah yeah divvy town to me is bigger than bing town in my mind so it (laughs) clearly (laughs) yeah that's that's how like wrong my (laughs) my positionings are so obviously divvy town is not bigger than Bingtown because he says it's all of the places that he's seen so far together Mm -hmm. but it is interesting to know that size wise there is a lot of potential Kenneth's right yes yes and so they're pulling in and he's hoping that Kenneth is just a braggart he's not going to be able to assemble the whole nation and rival anything or do anything with this nation of pirates because that's a scary thought yeah also showing his traitor family blood in that because change is scary (laughs) (laughs) then as they passed slowly down the long line of anchored vessels brashen saw a familiar profile limed against the setting sun his heart turned over in his chest then sank inside him the vivacia rocked at anchor here at her masthead the raven flag fluttered fitfully in the evening breeze brashen tried to convince himself that it was only a ship similarly outfitted with a similar figurehead Abruptly, Vivacia gave her head a shake, then reached up to smooth her hair. It was a live ship, all right, and she was unmistakably Vivacia. This Kennet had captured her. If the rumors were true, that meant every one of her cruisemen, crewmen had been slaughtered. He doesn't listen. Yeah. Literally, the last section had Sincur Falden saying, Oh, but the rumors are that not every one of the crew had been slaughtered. <laughs> to be fair... He is. He was using Sindin when that happened. We know True. Sindin fogs your memory, so yeah. maybe that's why. True. The figurehead turned to exchange greetings with a slender figure coming onto the foredeck. He knit his brow. The way the sailor moved seemed familiar. Althea. No, he told himself, it could not be. He had last seen Althea in Candletown, and she had declared she would find work on a Bingtown-bound ship. Vivacia had not been in the harbor. She could not be on the ship here. It was impossible. Save that he was familiar with the strange ways of winds, tides, and ships, and how unlikely paths always seem to cross in the strangest ways. He watched the slender figure come to the bow rail and lean on it. He stared, hoping for some gesture, some sign that would let him know it was not, it was or was not Althea. He got none. Instead, the longer he watched, the more convinced he became that it was she— So did Althea cock her head when she listened to the ship. Thus did she lift her face to the wind. Who else would converse so familiarly with the figurehead? By what chance he knew not, but the figure on the foredeck was Althea. Did he not know that Wintrow took Althea's place? I don't think so. Because, like, Kyle had to have a family member on board. Kyle can't just sail Vivacia on his own. Yeah. So... It had to have been somebody in Vive- or in Althea's family, and Wintrow was there for the funeral, which Brashen... Or maybe he knew, knew. but he knew Wintrow was, like, a small kid and yeah, maybe could Wintrow be this, and this grew just that much. reminds him too much of Althea, you know? Which, also, if they have the same mannerisms, yeah. you can also see that everyone's like, oh, they look exactly alike. Isn't it so freaky how family members actually do have sim- yeah. similar yeah. mannerisms? <laughs> True. It's always weird whenever I see my sister do something that I do all the time. I'm like, uh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's my thing. That's my thing. <laughs> and then you see your parent do the same thing. You're like, oh. <laughs> oh, yuck. <laughs> <laughs> Genetics, baby. Um, anyway, it is really interesting, though, to me that his first thought is Althea. Although we do know, I think this is further proof that Althea and 
Wintro are very similar looking. They seem like they could be twins almost. Yeah. In build and stature and just mm-hmm. how they hold themselves, which is kind of interesting because their personalities are completely different, but in looks wise at least. And I think this again goes back to what I said two episodes ago now when Amber is talking to Althea and not understanding how it can't be her who is the catalyst that she's thinking of. And I that like again points to like maybe it is something that she Just saw in a dream. Like mixing up. Because as kind of explained or described Wintro when he's coming in, he has his Wintro has his hair back, slicked back in that sailor's queue mm-hmm. like Althea has when Malta explains there's like oh it's a man here yeah and whenever Amber said when I saw you walking earlier I was struck again with this is correct and that yeah. was when Althea was dressed as a man so, so they have the same mannerisms I don't know yeah. I don't know but Brashen his mind is going a mile a minute because he's one man like what can he do what should he do Anything he tried now would likely just get him killed, and no one in Big Town would ever know what had become of any of them. His dull fingernails bit right through his calloused palms. He closed his eyes tightly and tried to think what, if anything, he could do. Captain Finney spoke softly from close behind him. Sure you don't know her? Brashen managed a shrug. His voice was too tight. I could have seen her before. I don't know. I was just marveling. A live ship, taken by a pirate. That's a first. No, it ain't. Finney spat over the side. Legend says that Igret the Bold took a live ship and used it for years. That's how he managed to take the satrap's treasure ship. Fleet as it was, it couldn't outrun a live ship. After that, Igret lived like a gentleman. The best of everything for himself. Women, wine, servants, clothes. Lived very elegant, they say. He had an estate in Chalced and a palace in the Jade's Islands. It has been said that when Igret knew he was dying, he hid his treasure and scuttled his live ship. If he couldn't take the damn thing with him, he was going to be sure no one else got it. I've never heard that before. Probably not. It's not a commonly told tale. They say he kept it painted and made it keep still so no one would know what he had. Brashen shrugged stiffly. Sounds to me like he had a regular ship, but just lied about it to make people think it was a live ship. (laughs) Maybe. And we know that is Paragon. Yeah. And that, what Captain Finney says, is all true. Maybe not all the palaces and stuff, but he did sail the sail Paragon up the Rainwild River a little bit, bury treasure, and then sink him. Yeah. My question is, is this a widely told tale in this area, and that's why Finney knows it? Or is Finney somebody who used to be a contact of Igret that Kenneth doesn't know about? Because, yeah, you know, kind of, kind of tries to get rid of all traces of Igret by like, yeah. killing people. So I'm just wondering if this is... I think Finney has been around a long time and probably just knows stories from back in the day, right? Mm-hmm. Like, Igret's been dead for 30 years, I think, about-ish. We think Kenneth's in his 40s? Yeah, Kenneth's okay. like f- early 40s, I think. Okay. So 30 years would put him at in teens. Young teen. Yeah. But yeah. So I think about that, you know. Okay. And Finney, according to Falden, has been doing this for a while. And there are honest men who have been out here (laughs) trying to make an honest living. (laughs) So I'm guessing just like he's in a position to hear rumors. Yeah. And if he's been doing this for 20 years... That was only a 10-year-old rumor, you know? Yeah. yeah. I feel like he might have heard it. Okay. I don't... Th- he, it could have been, but he doesn't seem to deal with pirates directly. He deals with people who have the pirate goods. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if he's a direct contact. Fair enough. So Brashen brings up, after saying that maybe it was just a regular ship... He brings up the Bingtown thing. And Finney seems a little guarded. And he's like, yeah, I I remember when I brought that up. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, well, I've just been thinking. If you were to buy that portrait from Falden, well, the place it would sell best is Bingtown. That's where folk would know what it was and how much it was worth. He crossed his arms and leaned back against the railing. He tried to look like a man well-pleased with himself. 
And that's also where a man could get into the hottest water selling such a thing, Finney pointed out suspiciously. Brashen affected a casualness he did not feel. Not if you knew the right people and pitched it the right way. Now, if you came to town and I hooked you up with the right go-between, why, you could make it seem like you were doing a good deed, just bringing the portrait home with a sad tale of what you knew. Leave it to the go-between that such a kind-hearted traitor, Captain, deserved a hefty reward for such a turn. Finney moved a quid of Sindon in his lip. Maybe, but the trip wouldn't be worth it to just unload one piece. Of course not, I'm just betting that that would be the plum piece of the deal. It might bring you a lot more than you'd imagine. Maybe a lot more trouble than I'd imagine, too. After a time, he asked, What else do you suppose might go there? He says some things that, you know, things that Pingtown can't make. And Finney asks, You know of someone who would be the go-between? Brashen tilted his head. I have a thought of a likely candidate. He gave a brief chuckle. If all else failed, I suppose I could try doing it myself. Finney wordlessly held out his hand. Brashen took it, in, and in the clasp the deal was sealed. He felt a deep sense of relief. He had a way to carry word back to Bingtown. Surely Ronica Vestrit would have the wherewithal to rescue both her daughter and her ship from these pirates. He glanced back at the Vivacia and Althea apologetically. This flimsy plan was the best rescue effort he could offer. He prayed Althea and the ship would both be well until then. He swore suddenly and vehemently. What's the matter? Finney demanded. Nothing. Just got a splinter under my nail. I'll put the boys to standing this railing tomorrow. He turned away from his captain and made a pretense of examining his hand. In the distance, the slim silhouette urinated off the side of the vivacia. Is he swearing because he's so shocked it's not Althea? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's... He turns back to offer that apologetic look at Vivacia and Althea, and he's like, oh my gosh, peeing off the side of the boat, that's not Althea. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> so, yeah, he, he's still going to bring it back, but he doesn't know who it was. Fair enough. But he'll find out in Bingtown. Well, that wraps up this chapter. Any last thoughts? It's kind of a long one. Yeah. I mean, it is right before a break in seasons again. Yes. Next time we're going to be reading from summer. It's officially mm -hmm. summer. We get more serpents. Yes. <laughs> they always come at the start of a season. <laughs> um, no, I just think it's so, it's really well done that it is an unknown. I mean, obviously the reader, we all know what's going on. So there's not that suspense, but it is kind right. of a, a suspense of, what is Brashen going to do? And seeing that he's going to try to make this deal. Why do you think? I guess we could talk about it when it actually happens. But why do you think it does fall through? Like is something here the thing that is too suspicious? I think it's just because when he gets to Bingtown, he leaves with the portrait and Finney doesn't hear about him for another couple hours. And he's just like, ah, something's mm -hmm. something's up. I'm just going to leave. Fair. Just doesn't want to get caught. Fair enough. I mean, I guess, was Brashen even going to really try to help him? I don't know. I don't think so. I think his plan is just to go back and stay off, basically. Interesting. Okay. Just curious. Yeah. But yeah, seeing him try to mull through a way to get back is really interesting. And having that. Do you think he could have done anything more? He could have at least gone to Vivacia and tried to get more information from Vivacia herself. True, but I think he'd be, if it was with Finney, he'd be worried about Vivacia giving him away, first of all. Well, he doesn't have to go with Finney, though, right? Because they're going shopping. True. And surely he has time to himself tonight I, or can sneak off the boat. He would have to sneak off, I think. And, like, couldn't he do that? I mean, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, they're... There is more he could have done, in my opinion. Right. This is the only the first time they see him, so maybe he does. Yeah, he doesn't, but maybe yeah. he does. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. This is, I think, I think he's right. This is like the best thing he could do. Just bring news yeah. back. No, and I definitely agree that it's it's better for him to do something safer to be able to ensure the news gets to Bingtown rather than risk his life, right? Because then nobody knows. Like, I think that is a good point and actually pretty well thought out for Brashen. And interestingly, I feel like even though Brashen is consistently mentioned as using Sindin during this time, 
he's still pretty alert. Yeah, I think you build up a tolerance. <laughs> Fair. But it's just something that I know, because I know, like, when we first were seeing him use Sindin, it was more, ooh, everything's all foggy, and, like, it was drug use, you I know? Mean, like. I mean, it, we talked about it kind of brings in the clarity as well kind of yeah. like a, a caffeine i guess or some sort of sharpening of focus but it definitely makes you overconfident yes mm-hmm. so well interesting chapter yeah thanks for taking along with us as usual if you have thoughts about it please let us know it is fits happy at gmail.com or comment on any of our posts on social media or message us directly on any of those You can also go to our website at isfitshappy.com and find more links, places to listen, or just the links to the episodes themselves. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you next week.